Good morning. Good morning. I think we're on. Ah, I, I just wanted to ask you, is this quiet or does everybody hear what I'm saying? Everyone hears you. It's loud and clear. Oh. I, I have you on speaker. Okay. Shall, uh, shall I begin? <clears throat> oh, do, you, do you want me to call you Fritz or Mr. Friedman? Fritz. Okay, Fritz. Or Fred, whichever one. <laughs> okay. I've, I've been called many things by many people many times. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are, okay. we are so honored to be able to have you today join us. We have a room full of kids that are so excited and eager to hear you. So yes, Can I see them. <laughs> Here, let me let me kind of scan and see if you can see them. Okay. I can see some books. Yeah. Yeah, there. there. Oh, yes. There they are. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Okay. We're, we're ready for you. If you'd like to go ahead and begin. We do have some uh, questions from the Certainly. kids. Would you like then, the questions? Do you want them to ask at the end or that, whenever they want to interrupt? No, I, that'd be fine at the end if you'd like to go ahead and share. Okay, that would be fine because um, <clears throat> if, there's an, if there's anything they do not understand, I will try and explain it. All righty. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Fritz Friedman. Uh, I am 73 years old, and I'm a very lucky man. Um, I was born in Czechoslovakia, which is in Europe, in 1939, three weeks before the Second World War began. I was born in a little village of Plesiewicz, which is about 1,000 people altogether there. Most of the people, it was agriculture. Uh, 1,000 people, that's about a sixth of what uh, um, Two Oaks has. Um, the place had, it was pretty primitive, it had one small railway station, one big road down the middle. It had two telephones, one for the policeman and one for the doctor. There was only one radio in the whole place, and that belonged to our landlord, who lived above us. There were about 60 Jewish families living in that place. My family was one of them. Uh, my mother, I'll show you a picture of her here. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. That is my mother with my eldest sister called Heidi. There she is wearing a, a black wig. Okay. My father, he owned an agency for teaching ladies how to use singer sewing machines. That was high tech in our part of the woods. Singer sewing machine, because once a woman had a singer sewing machine, she could be independent and work by herself. Um, about six months after I was born, I contracted polio. Do, do people know what polio is? Probably mainly the adults here. I don't know that the children know. Okay. My, my left leg was paralyzed. I had a virus in my uh, spinal cord, and my left leg was paralyzed and became shorter, and I could walk for short distances but if I had to go long distances, I had to be carried. 
I was unconscious for three days until I managed to recover. The medic medication was pretty, pretty primitive then. All they did was, the doctor said, to take a hot iron, not too hot, and run it up and down my legs just to improve the circulation. That's all that they knew. Now, um, we we had a, we had a we had, our landlord above us had a radio. It was a great big radio, looking like a great big TV set, something like this. And uh, nobody locked their doors, and I could walk into that neighbor's house, and they could walk into ours. And I asked the neighbor, how come somebody talking inside there, and how come sometimes there's music? And he told me, there's a dwarf in there, and he's got all sorts of musical instruments, <laughs> and he plays them. Well, I was a very curious child, this was about the age of four, and so one day I was lonely in the house, so I went out there, and I knocked politely on the radio, and I said, uh, could, he, could he please come out so, to give me some company? <laughs> and he never answered. I don't know why. So I knocked again. I said, if you don't come out, I will break it down and drag you out. <laughs> I was rather aggressive. I took out my little hammer, and I broke the glass on it. <laughs> and my father gave me a good spanking, and it took me quite some time to sit down comfortably. <laughs> Another thing that I remember my father did, we had a little balcony in our, house, in our house. It was the only one in the village on the second floor. And he used to ask me in the summer when it was hot, he said, uh, Fritzy, run outside in the balcony and sit I'm there. We were living in the, living, in, the, in the living room. So like an obedient child, I went out there and had a look and I said, no, you're not there. Why? He said, because it's very hot outside. Thank God I'm not outside. And he kept on saying this quite often, but I remember the balcony and I'll tell you about that later. Anyway, my grandfather, he was um, a bootmaker And he had served in the Hungarian-Austrian army. Anyway, in nine, when the Germans invaded Czechoslovakia in 1938, they gave our part of Czechoslovakia to the Hungarians. And most of the people there spoke Hungarian. Our family also spoke Hungarian. But at that time, when the Germans took over, no Jewish people were allowed to have any businesses. The Jewish doctor couldn't treat Christian people. All shops were taken away from the Jewish people and given to other people. So my father didn't have any livelihood and he had to go out and work in the, in the woods. He was quite old then, he was about 52 at the time and he was working out in all weathers and he became very ill. Anyway, suddenly, on the 8th of April, 1944, the police announced that all the Jewish people would have to assemble at the police station. Each adult was allowed to take one suitcase. Nobody else was to take anything else. They didn't tell us where we were going, or how long we'd be going. And my mother had a big problem, because by that time she'd had another child, a little baby brother called Robbie. I had a sister called Heidi. I was four, she was six. And I had a stepbrother from my previous marriage. He was about 12. And the big problem was what to put in that one suitcase for all these people. So we packed up the suitcase, and then my, my sister went to my father because he was staying at home because he couldn't, he was ill in bed. So 
He gave her his blessing. He put his hands on her head and blessed her. And I remember that because she had a little satchel on it with little red riding hood embroidered on it. And then he called me in and he put his hands on my head. <clears throat> and I could feel his fingers trembling. And then we walked out and we went to the, I was carried by my sister. My youngest aunt uh, was 12. She came with us, she carried the baby so that my mother could carry the suitcase. And my sister carried me. We all went to the, to the station, which was quite near our house, and we took the train to Budapest. Budapest is the capital of Hungary, and it took us a whole day to travel there in that train. At night, when we got there, <coughs> we were marched by the police to a prison called Moshoni. The men were separated from the women, children, and old people, and um, the men were taken to a work camp, and um, I went with my mother uh, and my grandmother and my sister, and my mother was uh, very religious and she was very, very offended that we were put into prison and in the prison there were thieves and nasty ladies, all sorts of horrible people, some of them, and then there was no bed, everybody had to lie on the floor. My mother wouldn't let us eat the food that they gave us because they, she said it wasn't kosher. It, does anybody know what kosher is? It is, it's, it has, to, it has to be clean food. And my mother wouldn't let us eat it because it was forbidden to touch anything that was unclean. So she told us to assuage our hunger to put pebbles in our mouths, to have something in our mouth so we could suck on them, chew them, to have saliva in our mouth. The sanitation there was terrible. It was just a hole in the ground for everybody. There was no privacy for anybody. We were there for 10 days. After about two days, she got permission from the rabbis that we could eat the food as there was nothing else. I went outside in the corridor in the courtyard and we looked up and the walls reached the sky. But sometimes little bits of food came tumbling down from our side so some kind people threw food over the wall knowing what conditions were inside there. After 10 days, we were taken out to a big camp called Kistacha, which was by the railway station. It was an enormous camp where all the people were assembled there to go to Auschwitz. Does anybody know what Auschwitz is? We have studied about Auschwitz. This was towards the end of the war, and um, there weren't that many trains. So the more people were coming in, into the Kistacha than could be taken out by trains. Each train would take about 3,000 people. <laughs> anyway, wait. The Jewish uh, Distribution Agency, which also um, came from America, some of their members had been cheated with Hungarians and said, as the war is ending fairly soon, because the Russians are approaching from the east, and the Americans and the British and the French are coming from the other side, Hungary was going to lose the war to get with the Germans, they suggested, let mothers who have children under the age of 14 to leave uh, Kistacha and go back and live in the ghetto at the expense of the Jewish people who lived in 
Budapest took the same money for the Hungarians. Yeah. Of course we couldn't escape from there because we were kept under guard in the ghetto. Now my mother had a big problem because she was the eldest of ten children. And she heard that her parents were going to go to Auschwitz and she didn't know what to do. So she asked the rabbis what to do and they said, honor your father and your mother. So she decided to go with her mother and her father together with the baby Remy. We thought it was a rehabilitation camp. That is what they told us. People would go there and they were treated, rehabilitated. She gave um, Heidi, my sister, and myself, and another Heidi belonging to another aunt of ours, to my aunt Magda, who was then 12 years old. She said, get my children until I come back from Auschwitz. But as it's a war, if I don't come back, make sure to get them to Palestine, which is the only country in the world that is willing to accept. She then told my Magda every to put her hands over my eyes and make sure that I would say my prayers. And then she got on the train together with my grandparents, disappeared. I went with Magda to the, for two years, this girl at 12, at the end of the war, she was 14, took care of me and my sister. Back to the Budapest, the siege of Budapest came because the Russians surrounded the town by one million Russian soldiers, all sides, nobody could get out, and they started to bombard the place. The siege lasted for three months. Artillery, uh, the Americans, the, the bomb, the Hungarians and the Germans, and we were inside the middle of it. Half the time we were living in ruins, in cellars, there was no food. Sometimes we put little pieces of brown wood in our mouth to chew on them, and we said it was only chocolate. It wasn't really, but we were playing games. When the siege finished and the Russians came, nasty people at that time, they were, they grabbed everything, they took watches from everybody, they took all people's possessions that they could. But then they looked at our papers and said, hey, you're Hungarians, we're supposed to look at Hungarians, you're Czechs, look to Prague. That's where the Americans, the American Red Cross is, go to Prague and they will take care of you. We had no adults with us, we were just children. So we said, how? How are we get to Prague? Have any money? or any permits or passports or anything. Anyway, we stayed there until an uncle of mine who'd been fighting in the, in the Red Army that deserted from there, that he found us, and we he decided, together with a few other youths, to cross the border into Czechoslovakia, from there walk to Prague. That was about 450 miles. <clears throat> it was night time we crossed the bridge. I was of course carried, it was deep snow. 
And we were walking like that for quite some time. I can't remember the, exactly all the dates and uh, details. I was carried, I was sleeping. One day we had one night of rest a farm which belonged to an elderly relative of ours who used to grow apples. I managed to eat one egg. That was the only time I ate an egg during the whole war. We slept in our clothes. The next day we carried on. We found bits of rotten turnips or potato peels, and we ate that. We melted snow to drink. And eventually, towards the end, we managed to get a train which took us into the center of Budapest where we were taken by the uh, American Red Cross. We were inoculated. We were given medicine. We were given food. We had our head shaved because we had lights. We had our teeth checked. Uh, I was nasty then because uh, anybody who wasn't a member of my family, I fought against them. I couldn't understand them. They were now speaking Czech. And I couldn't understand what they wanted. So, it, so if you can see. Can you see is that, is that Yes, sir. Uh, because that's me when I was six in Prague. And that is my, uh, my aunt Magda and my sister Heidi. And the picture underneath is us a year after that in England. Oh. You could, a little change. I hope that was clear. Um, Anyway, we were there in a, a hostel. I forgot to tell you in Budapest. The older, uh, the older girls, like my Aunt Magda was, twice the Hungarian guards took them to the Danube and they were all going to be shot and thrown into the Danube. But in the end, the Romanian government uh, put a stop to that. Romanians were complaining that all these dead bodies in the, was polluting the water in Bucharest, which was their capital. That's why they stopped that. Uh, that happened twice. Okay. Um, wait, Mark because nobody was willing to take us. My elder brother, he went with some youths to France to try and go from there to Palestine. And he succeeded after two years. And then in 1946, in February, we received word that the British government were permitting to take 1,000 children Jewish children who had been in the camps to the expense of the Jewish community. Find 723 children alive uh, who were under the age of 16. Of these, there were 23 children under the age of 12, and I was one of those. So, to uh, England, I'll show you the luxurious airliner we went in. Mm -hmm. Can you see that? Um, yes. This was a, a Lancaster bomber. And um, it's worked very good. <clears throat> and um, we sat in 
plates. There were no seats. All the kids sat on crates and were all bundled in there. Anyway, when we came to England, these were us. Did you see that? Is that clear? Yes, okay. sir. Okay? Yes, sir. I'm this fellow with this great big grin over here. Mm -hmm. That's me. Uh, this house here, can you see the house? Yes. That's Sir Benjamin Drage. And he let us live in that house. There were 22 rooms in that house. And he had about 400 acres of land around it. So he was a wealthy man and we lived there for three years. The woman who was in charge of it was this lady here, Alice Goldberg. Can you see? Yes. Program about her in the be in the in England on This Is Your Life because she ran this uh, place. Uh, it was called We're Courtney. Three years learning how to speak English. We went to school with uh, other children and pretty quickly we learned to speak English. Uh, we learned to play musical instruments. We, were, we had to do painting and painting. Uh, uh, we were taken to concerts, we were taken to plays. Uh, the woman who was in charge of our mental health was the daughter of uh, Sigmund Freud. And she uh, treated, uh, those who did treat, she was in charge of that. Uh, we were treated very well. We had a picture that you should see. We got parcels, America food parcels. Is that clear? No. <laughs> okay, now, well, I, yes, I see. But about food parcels, it was wonderful because we ate better than the English. Oh. <laughs> Seriously, because England then had rationing. No rationing is everybody had a certain amount of meat you could have. You couldn't buy you couldn't buy sweets or chocolates. Only a tiny bit. Uh, you had you had one egg a day per person. Uh, hardly any cheese. In our place. We got these great big parcels with uh, uh, sweet cheers and lots of chocolate Hershey bars, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, the other English kids, they were jealous, you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, at the age of 11, we, from there we moved to a smaller house because many of the older girls had gone to Israel, my, my aunt Magda. By that time, Israel was founded in 1948. Big girls uh, went there, including my aunt Magda, when she went to join uh, my uncle, who had a farm. Uh, I had an operation, uh, three operations, uh, in the London hospital to have my leg fixed up. Um, if, if anybody, did anybody see the, first, uh, the film Forrest Gump? Did anyone in the school see Forrest Gump? There's several. Yes. <laughs> yeah, do you hear them? They're saying, run, Forrest, run. Um, I, I had those little splits on my legs. <laughs> see, but uh, a doctor fixed my leg up so I didn't have to. And uh, I could then walk. And I walked a lot. I mean, uh, I went on hikes. I went up to 30 kilometers a day walking with the others. And I was in the Boy Scouts and I rode cycles. I cycled all over Belgium and uh, Luxembourg. So my leg was okay. It didn't, it did well, but uh, it was okay. Anyway, the other place went to normal school. But. Nobody ever knows what had happened in the camps. 
we, we do. We read papers, etc., etc. But nobody told me your mother and father have died or be killed. But gradually, all the children realized the other children that were with me, there were six of them who had been in, in Auschwitz and had tattoos on their arms. There were two girls from Italy uh, who Alice Oberger found their parents who were back in Italy and they went to join them. Um, but then when I finished school at 18, I uh, decided to go to Israel to uh, go to see my Magda, uh, to see Magda and my other uncle uh, because I regarded England was a place for me to recover from what had happened during the war. But I wanted my own country. I wanted to be in part of a majority, not in a part of a mi minority. So at the age of 80, I, uh, with about $40 in my pocket, I took a boat to Israel and I went to a kibbutz. Who knows what a kibbutz is? Does anybody know what a kibbutz is? No. It's a community farm where everybody is equal. Nobody gets every every nobody gets paid. You get everything that you want there. You eat together in a communal house. The children have communal uh, houses, or children don't live with their parents, or didn't live with their parents. And you and everything you need. You know, you, you get to everybody gets uh, their clothes, etc., etc., and you get an allowance, but uh, you get everything that you want. What was the name of that? Kibbutz Ma'agan Michael. Okay. He told me in England it was a fishing kibbutz of Anglo Saxons. Well, in it there were three people who could speak English. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, I worked there as a fisherman on a trawler in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, Israel, if you don't, uh, have they studied uh, um, geography about Israel? Did they know what, uh, where it is? We did. We, uh, we have some Israel pen pals, so we did quite a bit of study about Israel. So it's pretty um, It's about... You could fit 34 Israels inside Texas. 34 of it. It's, if you don't have good brakes, you go right out the border. <laughs> anyway, I went there and after a couple of years to learn Hebrew, I went and became a physical therapist, which is my profession. Physical therapist. Because the doctor in England, but I said, uh, I want to see what, what they need over there. Mm -hmm. I don't spend learning years and finding that the place is crawling with doctors. And in fact, there were doctors in Israel, but there weren't any physical therapists. Okay. Went to a therapy school and studied there. And I've been working on that the whole time. Um, When I was about 50 years after that, I um, went with my son back to Pleshevitz, the, the village where I was born. And I'd left it at the age of four. And the people there were only speaking Hungarian. I don't speak Hungarian. And he, he of course, didn't know any. I'll, I'll show you a picture of him with, with the rest of my family, just... Yes. Yes, we see it. He studied art in the Mitzalil uh, Art Academy. And he wanted to fulfill of the, of the place where uh, I'd come from. So we flew out there and we took a taxi from Krakow 
Um, um, and we came to the railway station, the one that I had gone to from there to, to Budapest. And he said, Dad, where did you live? We had no photographs of I'd never been there since then. So I pointed to a house and said, see that one over there? I lived. He said, how do you know? Of course he didn't believe me. Mm -hmm. so I hadn't been there for so long. I had left there when I was four. So I said, look, I'm going to stay here. You go there and you will find that the, the side of the house facing south, because that was where the sun came in at that time, you will see a staircase going at a diagonal outside, a wooden one, from the ground floor, and on top you'll find a great big wooden door on the upper side. And he went there, it's, it's it. It's the only house with it in the whole place. Then we went to the rest of the village and I said, and that is the house where I was born. I said, how do you know? I said, look on the side facing east, and you will see on the second floor a little stone balcony, which I told you about when my father had told me to go and look for him there. Yes. And he said, that's it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I knew where everything was. I knew where grandfather's house was and grandmother and uh, um, there is a... Um, uh, they, they, put, they put a, a book in the village hall where all the people who had died in the Holocaust down it there. And I had a look in it and I found my name was there. That was a bit premature. <laughs> <laughs> Sister and so was my aunt they had written down everybody who'd lived in, in the place. Now, other strange concerns, when I was working in the hospital, a rabbi came in there, an old rabbi came in, and he only wanted me to treat him because he didn't want a girl to treat him. So I treated him, and he asked me where I came from, and I told him, and he nearly fainted. He said, just before the I was going to marry a girl from that t uh, village and become the rabbi of that place. And I went back to prepare for the wedding, and then the war broke out, couldn't come, and he married another girl later on. He went to concentration camp and he survived. And he came to Israel and he found his wife, it, he found his girlfriend that married else. She, she worked so long. That was funny. And also, um, my son had his bar mitzvah at the 13. Um, we found in the street living next to me was a woman who had looked after my father when he was ill. And we didn't know. And so, yeah. I found Magda and my sister, she's uh, uh, living on Kibbutz Magen Michael at the, at the time. And I grew up uh, a family and I'm living a normal life. And uh, I think very important to, to know what has happened. I feel no anger at what has happened. I feel I want revenge. Revenge doesn't help. All it does is hurt yourself. You have to forgive people who did evil. They don't think they were doing evil. You don't know what the other person is thinking. It's a matter of, it's a point of view. To free yourself, you have to forgive, because you have to build, and um, that's about it. Any questions? I'm going to have the kids come up and ask you the questions, if that's okay.
Okay. This question is from Haley Spencer. How long was... What's up? What? Was a plane without food or water or anything? Uh, uh, black planes, bombers flying uh, about, and a uh, plane that practically tried to stop a bombing. So uh, you sometimes stopped in tunnels, uh, and you you gave other trains. Like our trains, it took a whole day. About three hours. Thank you. This question is from Abby Hinton. Did you ever lose hope of surviving and going home? Did you ever lose hope of surviving and going home? Well, we weren't going to go home. I think... I did not... No, no, please. Home, there were no adult... How was I going to live? We were children. My aunt, who was 12 or 14, uh, had a house. So, we're going to live. How are we going to uh, earn uh, money? See the problem? I mean, could you, uh, how old are you? 11. Are you? How old are you? 11. Eleven. Well, I was just one year older. Now, could you have survived by living in um, your town, White Oaks? Could you live there by yourself at the age of twelve, with two with two uh, two small children? What? Well, that's what my auntie faced because she had nobody else. We had to be with grown-ups who would take care of until we grew up. So, uh, in tables, nothing. We had no money, no respects, no relatives. There were six million uh, members of the Jewish race who were killed. Men, women, and children. Very few people had survived. So how could... Okay? Well, it's not okay, but you understand. Thank you, sir. Thank you. What was the biggest obstacle in surviving the Holocaust? What do you think it was? I can't hear. We can't hear you. Can't hear at all. Oh, there we go. Cutting in and out, we can't really hear you all the way. Any better? Yes. Yes, sir. Better. Yes, sir. 
Okay. The biggest obstacle was, first of all, the Germans and the Hungarians were trying to kill us. <laughs> That's an obstacle. They had guns. We didn't have guns. They had transport. We didn't. What they were trying to do was to, to they were trying not to get us to panic because they weren't telling the truth. They told us that you go to Auschwitz, it's a rehabilitation camp. We didn't know what it was. Nobody knew. And also, there was very, very little food. For instance, during the siege of Budapest, no food came into the place, and the people were eating the horses that had been uh, killed by the bombing dead horses that were lying in the streets. And, uh, and that was rationed out to the German troops. Each German troop was allowed to have 100 grams of meat a day. For the civilians, there was practically nothing left. There was no clean water. And, uh, of course, very few people could live in any houses because most of the houses were bombed out. There were no roofs. Many houses we lived in, there were no roofs. No window, no heating. So, it was tough. I mean, uh, we just tried to get by as much as, uh, as far as you could. I mean, uh, I'll tell you uh, one place I remember a group of kids were eating a cat. Uh, I didn't, but... Uh, <laughs> I mean, I keep three cats at home when they're here. They would never forgive me if I'd eaten a cat. Okay, any other question? <clears throat> That's all the questions that we have for now. We cannot thank you enough. I, I, I thank you and your advice about forgiving and letting go and going on and rebuilding. That is a lesson for all that we needed to hear. And I, I thank you so much for your words and your message. And, and I, I hope that maybe we can do this again another time. Sure. So. Whenever you like. Whenever you like. I'm at your disposal. Oh, yeah, should, should I read on the poem about uh, oh, bread? Please do. Please. Okay. Here we go. I had. Okay. Go, yes. This is the. Guys, this is the poem that he wrote for his son to better understand his experiences as a child. Okay. <clears throat> It's called Bread. I wrote it when I was about uh, 18. Close cropped and hungry, we sat in a train. We were free. The war was over. The Russians had come. Hunger remained. I think the train was bound for Prague. I thought of, all I thought of was bread. Magda, my aunt, only a few years older than my six years, had three slices. She gave me one. My sister, two years older than I, the second. Herself, the last. In a few seconds, my slice was gone. I watched my sister. She held her bread, clutched in both hands to her breast. With bowed head, slowly, oh so slowly, she took one bite. And just as slowly, meditatively, she chewed. I only watched the bread with its half-moon bay. Heidi bent her head once more, but just before she took a bite, she felt my eyes, stopped, looked up slowly, looked at me. And looked at me. I saw an equal hunger in her eyes, and bowed my head. She sat on the seat opposite to me, gently, 
something was pressed into my lap, a slice of dry, stale bread with a half-moon bay. Okay, that's it, folks. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I'll be signing off now. Okay, back to class. <laughs> and I, I guess you have to go to bed now. <laughs> uh, no, no. Uh, by, by the way, um, in the Holocaust Museum in uh, Washington. Yes, sir. They got a program about Alice Goldberg, the woman who looked after us. Really? And, and some of the uh, paintings that we made as children, because we had lots of psychiatrists examining us. And as we couldn't speak English, they asked us to paint or draw what our feelings were. They took 12 of these paintings and made a calendar. Oh, my goodness. Which, which the, they, uh, I've got the calendar, and they uh, made it. Uh, one of the pictures is mine. So uh, That's pretty wonderful. Uh, uh, so if you can look it up, it's uh, in the... Uh, Rebecca Erbling okay. is the curator of the Alice Goldberger collection because she was this wonderful woman who looked after us and made us healthy and whole. That is wonderful. What a blessing. Okay. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.